Just stop it. The -the run-of-the-mill, cheesy, humdrum bullshit status quo just tires me out. What fascinates me are the industry disruptors, the superhuman frontiersmen or women who go through hell to achieve their goals. Join me as we meet and learn from those mavericks, rebels, and business leaders that aren't afraid to piss off the establishment in order to make radical change for good. Sponsored by Johto PR, the disruptive anti-PR firm that murders your competition with cinder blocks and cyanide. This is Disruption Interruption. Welcome back, everybody, to Disruption Interruption. I'm your host, KJ, and we're here today to talk to another industry leader that has steered off the lame, tired path of the status quo. Today's guest is disrupting B2B go-to-market data. He's a passionate problem solver. And we're talking to him today because B2Bs are drowning in data. Processing that data into something useful is super hard. And often, companies end up directly with raw data, leading to poor outcomes. Our guest mission is to ensure that B2B companies can have those insights and deliver more revenue growth faster. Coming to us live from Copenhagen, Denmark, please welcome our disruptor, CEO and co-founder of Dream Data, Lars Gronegaard. Hey, KJ. Hey, KJ. It's so good to be on the show. And I mean, I really love the intro. And thanks for pitching what we do so well and what I work with so well. Uh, I think you really captured a lot of the essence there. Well, you're so welcome. And I love the name of the company, Dream Data, because we are drowning in data. I mean, I know data is the new oil, but man, it's a tsunami that... We just don't know what the hell to do with, <laughs> right? We, we're trying to make it a good dream, but I I totally agree that for a lot of people, data is actually becoming more of a nightmare because you're having so much of it. And also you'll have multiple data sources describing the same thing. Like that, And I think that goes for whatever you're doing. Like we care, we work in B2B go-to-market. So that's the space I know the best, but you will have many different systems describing the same person, often the same interactions will be described in multiple systems. And which one do you trust? How do you get anywhere with that? How do you go from like this maybe data swamp to some beautiful ocean that you can sail on where you can sort of set direction, you can be actionable, you know where you're going. Uh, Yeah. That's a really good analogy. Dream a nice dream, not a bad dream. A data swamp. (laughs) The data swamp. You don't want to be there. Well, you know, before we dive into the status quo of data, because I really want to get into the nuts and bolts of it, tell me what is your personal ingredient to disruptive innovation? I think uh, I would describe myself as a bit of a contrarian. I think if you go back and ask different bosses that I've had previously prior to founding a company, they would say that I was not a person who would accept the status quo. I would be a person to, who would constantly challenge it. I would probably be a very annoying employee. I've been, I think, blessed by having bosses that like that and appreciated it and gave space for me to evolve. Uh, so I think that that's a very sort of key ingredient. And I think probably for most disruptors, that is a key ingredient, being contrarian, uh, wanting, like not being satisfied with what exists already. Yes. And, you know, I'm really glad that you've had bosses in your career that have helped (laughs) foster that. But, you know, you're such a happy guy. It's kind of (laughs) hard to be mad at you on a contrarian level, right? (laughs) There's got to be something good about it if you're happy. So let's talk about the status quo, right? Because you look at things from a contrarian level. It's not good enough. Let's talk about the status quo of go-to-market data. What the heck is going on? You 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 mentioned it a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Time. I think it is for me. For, for like you can say, starting maybe at another end, um, like in the good old days or bad old days, sales. We're in the B two B space. Sales would be salespeople talking to customers, and you could say the salesperson was the gate or the the gatekeeper of information towards the customer or the buyer. It was a very controlled process. And now, uh, sort of over the last 20 years and very much accelerated by the last couple of years, buyers, they don't like that. 
like they are sort of pushing to self-serve self-research um i think it's not uncommon to say that 70 to 80 percent of the buying process happens before like buyers even talk to the company and there's also been studies out saying that i think like vast majority of buyers i think 75 percent prefer various modes of self-service um and interactions that are not sort of directly with a salesperson so i think that is sort of a big trend that is happening in the market and in many ways self-service and and providing the the information for those people buying that's the job of marketing and various other forms of people like maybe they're called different things in the company but fundamentally the typical like in most companies they're the marketing team so the marketing team is getting more and more like in the bad old days the marketing team would be the team of like doing the summer party doing the roll-ups for the event creation uh, doing the sales presentation yeah. yeah that's not the case anymore like great companies now marketing is a revenue driver and so now you're having that plus you can say we are very much involved with tech companies and software companies very often the product also plays a big part in that initial go-to-market motion so you have the the bad old days was quite simple you would have the salesperson he actually she probably had the whole thing in her head oh <laughs> he was doing it with his roller deck so maybe a crm system but that's not how you do it anymore right now there are so many digital touches there's so many things happening in the customer journey um that you you get to this data swamp and the 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 reality of many different truths about what actually happened in that buying journey and that's the status quo now. So you have this move towards more and more data being generated, which is great, but something is missing to sort of provide that holistic view of that data. You can say maybe the CRM system, the customer relationship management system was supposed to do that, but that basically, the pro that was the promise of CRM, but it just became the sales system, right? So what's actually giving you the view of the customer? What's holding all that data? Yeah, that's the, that's what the is holding quote. all that data? <laughs> and yeah, I, yeah. I do want to uh, lament a little bit here for marketing because yeah, um, it is very, very true. It's it, it's a high pressure job. It's usually, uh, you know, it is a revenue driver. Uh, a lot of CEOs consider it a cost center. They don't really totally. look at it from a viewpoint of um, what it really does. You know, they know they yeah. need it. Um, and they are not able to be as creative as they used to be, you know, and really create that customer experience. And they're typically understaffed, yeah. right? Typically understaffed. Yeah. And I think we see now sort of with, uh, I don't know if it's a recession happening, but at least sort of a like negative economic, macroeconomic environment, the first people to get hit is the marketing team, right? They're hit on the media budget they're hit by layoffs and i think they there's a lot of companies out there that maybe pay a lip service to the idea of marketing as part of the revenue machine but don't fundamentally believe in it right yeah um and sometimes and, and then it puts I, too I think, much data on sales i believe if if it is not given the proper importance it puts the burden and the onus on sales which yeah. is the end of the funnel which creates this frenzy and this inability yeah. for salespeople to really um, have all the data that they used to have about the product. I mean, also you know, that, yeah, totally, and yeah, and, and <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. so you're cutting down on marketing. Um, something we see is that's because you don't have the complete view of the customer journey, you cut down on marketing and it, it looks great. You cut marketing by 50%, the numbers are great. You're still selling the same, but that's because it need to be the customer journey is so long. We're seeing like, like six months, 12 months, 24 months is not unusual, right? So if you cut marketing that is building that funnel, the pain will happen later. Like the first couple of months, it looks great because you're not spending money on marketing. You're just making money on sales. It's great. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, that is a big pain. And so that's a a really significant, significant thing to look for. Like, 
Do you actually know this, the average statistics of the pain that comes later and when it comes later? Yeah, I think we made a, we actually did sort of a benchmark report based on companies we know, which is, of course, not all companies in the world, but I think maybe based on four, 500 companies that are like various B2B SaaS companies. So it's a niche, right? Uh, and we came out with this in a, about Easter. And the joke I made was, hey, if you want to have a strong closing for Christmas in December, you better start working now. That's sort of the average time it takes for our for that group of companies we look at from generating demand to closing a business, right? And for some companies, it's much longer. Eight months. Yeah, eight, nine months. And I think most, most companies, when they talk about the sales cycle, they'll be talking about the time it takes for a salesperson to close the deal. Mm -hmm. That might be 30 days, 45 days, 60 days. But what about all the stuff that happened before? Right. And I think the data swamp, what creates a sort of a disadvantage for for the people creating demand is that the CRM system is treated as like first class data and that CRM system is holding very powerful data saying hey this sales rep closed this deal he made all this money isn't it great and of course it is I mean we celebrate when people close the deal at our end too right but what about all the stuff that happened before where's the data about that uh, and if you want a successful and healthy business, if you want to grow as fast as possible or as lean as possible, you need to understand that. You need to integrate that data from all the other parts of the go-to-market motion that you're doing. It's a funnel or a flywheel. I don't care what you call it, but you're doing a lot of things and you want all that data to live in the same place so that you can do analytics on it. You can action it from one place so you can have one source of truth around that you could say that's the dream and what dream a dream data. i was gonna say that it like, is a oh, dream it's a, a dream. dream oh yeah, dream yeah. data well, yeah, yeah dream data that was, that's how we came up with the name yeah i would say it's not like a lot of companies that they are doing this um and what you then do is you build this yourself like you have a great data team and then you pull all the data in from the different systems and you hire some great data engineers and they built this for you but that takes a long time right and it's super expensive got it so tell me this what are the parts of go to market the data what are all the parts that need to be looked at i, I so First of all, it's like all the, I think typically the marketing data, the closer you get to the deal, the better is it's represented. So mm. you want to sort of push back and look at all the data that happens early on. So very often in a B2B scenario, you got some people buying and then you can sor sort of trace back to when they asked to talk to sales. You can do that. But okay. also very often, those people were not the ones that started looking at your product. Right. They were different people. So you want as good as you can to connect all those sort of early indicators and all the early data around demand. You want to connect that into the whole buying journeys because that's everything. Like, of course, the sales is valuable. And of course, it's valuable that you're doing great job sort of converting people from that sort of can I talk to sales? But you can't just magically create a hundred of those situations unless you know what is happening before that. That's how, like, by knowing that, by knowing what works in that process, that's how you can create more of that. You can grow in a more rational or more effective way, right? And I and I would say rational always, <laughs> some people don't like the word rational. <laughs> For me, rational is also what allows sort of creativity because if you have rationality around what you're doing, if you can prove what you're doing, well, then there's also more space for things you can't prove is working, right? If you have a lot of things that you have strong proof that this is working, like doing webinars or physical events or buying ads or whatever you're doing, writing content, like all this, you should know what works and what doesn't work. And then there's a whole lot of, like there's a lot of exciting things that you might never be able to do, right? Like you and me uh, writing to each other on LinkedIn, it's not going to go like LinkedIn is not going to give away that data. That would be wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, it, we're not going to put it in a CRM or track it somehow. So some of this data is lost. 
you have to accept that. But everything that can be captured, you want that to be captured. And you want to bring in this early data from sort of the start of the buying process. All the stuff that had to happen Easter if you want to sell for Christmas, right? <laughs> yes, exactly. And so we're talking about the very top of the funnel. Yeah. All the way to the bottom of the funnel, right? Totally, yeah. This is another factor that um, is a big problem in marketing to sales, right? Even in PR is the attribution yeah. um, designation, right? So yes, people look at who bought when they started talking to sales, right? But then you said, typically there's other people that are doing the research that start yeah. getting information first, right? But all the particular touch points that they've had, right? They read an article in an industry publication. They, um, you know, looked up the company on their website. They were retargeted. They, yeah. <laughs> right, get now they get a marketing message, right? They went to a mm -hmm. webinar. Like all of these attribution factors, either they don't have it, they have a little bit of it, or it's just ignored because they don't know how to track yeah. it. Am I right? Totally. And I think a lot of people, I think a big problem that happens is that you say, well, I can't track all of it. So I'm just going to ignore it instead of saying, hey, I'm actually going to take everything that I can. I think it's also about what you feel like as a company, you also have to decide what do you think is reasonable to track then within that and what is legal. You track things about your customers and the buying process as much as you can and want to do. And you use that then for attribution modeling, for instance. So you want that, like, I think attribution modeling is basically just taking the final, like one of the business outcomes you're looking for, like closing a new business deal and then assigning that value back to all the stuff that happened before, right? That's attribution. It's not, I think the hard thing about attribution is it, it's not really sort of uh, like, like spreading that value out of a bunch of touch points. The hard thing is having a, like a data model or a data set where you can do that, where you have the business outcome and as many of the touch points as possible. Right. And it would have to be weighted based off importance or based off of, yeah. you know, did they go to yeah. the next point? Did they go to the next point? Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's too, like, it, depending on, on, on sort of the, the amount of data, if you have a small data set, let's say you're doing either sort of a, few deals a month because you're doing massive deals well doing sort of machine learning or ai doesn't really make sense because you don't have enough data if you have a more transactional business if you're doing sort of hundreds of deals a month then it's reasonable to do machine learning and then you basically try to get the weighting from sort of advanced math right you sort of paint a picture of the um average journey that leads to a sale and then you say okay if i remove this what's the impact? If I remove this, what's the impact? And then by doing that, you can sort of apply, go the other way and apply weight to the different uh, like channels, like organic search or paid or this campaign. Well, say, you know, you have all that data, right? And you remove this and this happens. I mean, it is a constant tweaking and testing pilot yeah. method to really determine what works, right? Um, yeah, I think any any model for this, the real thing that you want to be looking at is does it deliver interesting business outcomes? And I think a lot of people sometimes get lost there and say, oh, I'm just going to be looking at my little uh, number there, see if it's moving and that's great. But you need to sort of constantly go back and look at, okay, is it actually working? Let's say, for instance, you think if I get somebody to sign up for a webinar, that's great. We know that they convert into new business, maybe it takes four months. Um, and they do that at maybe 5% or something. And it's going to create a lot of webinars because that's easy for me. And all of a sudden you, you double that, but the conversion drops to, I don't know, 3%. Maybe you it's not so it. great anymore. <laughs> or yeah. maybe it becomes a lot better. I think it's about, I think whatever, if it's good or bad, uh, it's about sort of always coming back and looking at uh, what sort of the outcome you were looking for. Yeah. which was sort of efficient growth. You want to come back to that all the time. I think a lot of, actually a lot of uh, companies got lost in attribution by sort of, you know, 
doing attribution to early stage, um, like early funnel things, like maybe a marketing qualified lead and then optimizing marketing qualified leads and then forgetting to look at, okay, are these leads continuing to sort of behave the way we want them to behave? Because if I'm tripling the leads, but I'm only adding like 5% of business, uh, probably not, you know. Probably not, not so good. Thing. Not, Probably not what you were looking for. Yeah, no, not really turning exactly. into a sales qualified lead, right? Yeah, I think one of the like, so we are, of course, a lot about this sort of trackable data you can stuff into a database. <laughs> That's what we're doing. I think there are other ways of doing attribution or thinking about what happened that can capture some of the sort of dark funnel or gray funnel. Uh, you can ask people. I think the fundamental thing is always like we always would we would always ask people, like, how did you, how did you find us? We'll trust our attribution models from our data, but we will also be asking people, like, how did you hear about us? Because it might not be the same, right? And if you're super advanced, then you can sort of mesh it all together into a combined model. Like some people do that. That's very advanced, right? How much of the data is actually that's there, the swamp of data? How much of it is actually used? Of the data is used? Yeah. How much of it is actually used before, like in the swamp? And when it's in the swamp, if you're not doing anything beautiful to it, uh, it I think the worst thing is actually if people use it <laughs> because now you're sort of, uh, you're taking this data and you're transforming it into something that looks beautiful, maybe a visualization, and then you go and show it to somebody and say, hey, look at this beautiful truth that I'm showing to you. And everybody's forgetting that the data underneath was shit, which means that the beautiful thing that you're showing to people is also shit. Um, and that's very bad. So I think the, the data swamp, the data in the data swamp, the worst thing that can happen more or less is that people use it. You really want to sort of do something to the data before you start acting on it, right? Yeah. Uh, so this the, is really scary for venture capitalist firms too, right? It's scary for everybody. It's scary, it's scary and I think for it's everyone. Happening. It's, it's happening. happening. It's happening all the time in boardrooms, management meetings, QBRs, like everywhere it's happening. You're doing sort of beautiful visualizations. You're doing beautiful arguments. And very often, you even the people presenting, they forgot that what they did to the data was bad, right? That they made some assumptions that were really, really bad. Like yeah. a very typical scenario is you just forget about uh, you're a B2B, but you just ignore the fact that you're selling to multiple, like that a company is multiple people. Just ignore that. You just count people because that's what a lot of products do. And then you just show, say, for instance, what's my conversion rate from demo request to, I don't know what you need, like, or maybe just going to my website or looking at a webinar and then booking a demo. But you look at it at a personal level, like people, how many people did it, how many people did it. But then when you look underneath and say, okay, how many companies did it, how many companies did it, the numbers are very different, right? And you ignore that because it's too complicated. So you, you ignore it at the data level and then you show the other numbers and maybe you care about optimizing that conversion and you show that it's going up, but you're forgetting what you did to the data underneath. So maybe you're not actually improving the world. Maybe you're just, maybe you're making the world worse. Maybe you're handing like bad leads to sales, right? Because your data models are, you know, you made bad decisions early on. Yeah, that sucks. <laughs> Gary. <laughs> so what is the what is the disruption? What's the innovation? And why is it disruptive? How does it work? Yeah, I, I think a lot, like I said, a lot of companies are solving this with a data team that is sort of migrating all the data into data warehouse, processing it into models and doing a great job there. I think the disruption is doing it as a product. I think that's what we saw because we did. The other thing in another company, right? We had we had all these problems. We didn't know 
anything. We couldn't figure out how we were making money in that company we were at before. So we built a solution for this by taking all the data, putting in a data warehouse, blah, 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 doing all that like magical processing, cutting a lot of corners and showing some beautiful visualizations and con convincing people it's great. And it, I, I would say it was good, but in that case, we did cut a lot of corners because we didn't have forever to build this. So I think the disruption here is we're going to give this to you as a product. So instead of you sort of buying a lot of other products, hiring a team building, you sign up for our product and 24 hours later, you have it, which is like, that's disruptive because like the process of building is like, I don't know, 365 days or 720 days. And now you're doing it in 24 hours, right? How did you get it down to 24 hours? I think that's just two years to 24 hours. <laughs> I think it is working through many, many cases of customers, getting that data, figuring out how do we create sort of a one bottle that works for all these. And then it is just a lot of work, just work. work, work. It's that is the processing of the data uh, in a uniform way. It's just work. And and it, it just a lot. No, it, that's not going to be good enough for our listener. They're like, work. What are you talking about? <laughs> it is basically, you know, here's a day. Like you start with a couple of data sources, then you have an idea about the data model you want to end up with. You manipulate them into that. Now there's a new customer coming through the door. They have a different CRM system. Oh, now the data looks different. Now we're going to make sure that that data, even if it's different, will end up in the same way out here. Um, at the end result model. And then people say, okay, what about our, our help desk system? We want that data in there as well. You take in send desk data, you model that into the model. And uh, that's what I mean by it's just work. It's just it. system or data source by data source. You extract the data, you learn the structure of the data and you map it into your data model. So that's why it's just work, but it's just a lot of it. So if you have, I think the average number of tools in um <clears throat> go to market tech stack and B2B across all companies is like 10 tools. Uh we work with B2B SaaS is like a crazy number, it's much, much higher. So if you're doing this yourself, you have to look at each tool. You have to look at the data swamp data that comes out of it. You have to figure out, okay, what are these 15 tables and like how do I make sense of them? And that's the work we did. We looked at all those tables, we learned how they are structured, and then we mapped them into our dream data model. That's awesome. What are some of the outcomes that you've been able to create for companies on their go-to-market data and how has it helped them? So I think the, the most, like you can say, there are outcomes at the sort of strategic level, which is prioritizing between different uh, marketing disciplines. So you can move uh, move investment from, say, different types of paid ads into uh, maybe organic content. So by demonstrating that actually organic content, even though it takes longer, is also driving revenue, you can reprioritize your budget. So that's one thing that happens. And then the next level is um, if you look into, let's, one of the big platforms where people are spending a lot of money, like uh, Google search ads, lots of like venture capital is really driving uh, we have a lot of venture back companies and i can say venture capital is driving a lot of revenue for google right right but when you look at look at those all those individual campaigns that you're running if you can optimize those towards revenue instead of just towards clicks or form fills, yeah. you can we see very often that people can save 40, 50% and deliver the same results, or they can take those 50% and reinvest them maybe into more creative marketing so that you can, if you can, let's say you have a, I don't know, million dollar ad budget for, right. uh, for, for Google ads. Uh, if you can save 40% on that, well, that's $400,000. I guess you can hire two or three really great marketers that can write content for you. Or you can buy other campaigns. If there are campaigns you can buy, you could do that. But this is where I say being rational and structured and having data also is sort of the foundation for creativity in many ways, right? Because if you're very creative and you don't have anything to sort of 
bring back when you're challenged on this sort of like, are you actually contributing to revenue? Well, then you're at risk next time a recession hits, right? So you want as much of like, you want to sort of balance what you're doing so that you are, you know, I've seen companies then because they don't, they can't, and it's also very bad for the company. They have a large ad budget and now times are bad. Somebody comes in and says, cancel the ad budget. And nobody can say anything because nobody can see the actual sort of result of those campaigns. But if you can go back and say, okay, well, actually, I agree. Maybe we can cut the ad budget somewhat because I get that we're going to save some money, but let's not cancel these campaigns that are actually working and that are a sort of a fundamental part of a go-to-market and are delivering revenue for us. That's a but big problem. I was just it, looking up while you were talking. I mean, the problem of you know, the Google ad campaigns, right? That people aren't able to see. And, you know, the hobby horse becomes just increase the budget, just increase the budget, just increase the budget. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. And, you know, they don't know the true data. They feel like they're getting taken yeah. advantage of, right? <clears throat> they are, I don't know. Um, but it is, it, it is a constant pain point for sure. Yeah, exactly. And then with it, cookies going away, kind yeah. of going away, how does that impact things? I think it, it like sort of privacy measures and it's like privacy measures and browsers because it's more than just cookies. It's impacting different go-to-market emotions in different companies differently. Let's say if you're a business to consumer company that is built around an, an a mobile app and that's how you make money then you're in trouble <laughs> that's bad that is bad very bad that's very bad um but if you are so sort of for our customers i would say you can get hit very hard depending on how you act in it i think what we've seen in in the space is basically over the last maybe five years there's been this constant move towards like first party data so we want as a company to own our own data. So we want to track our customers so that we know what they're doing. I think that's very reasonable, but we don't want that data to live somewhere that's not ours. Amen. It's great that we have a we have a company helping us. It could be us, it could be like a segment, it could be like lots of companies can help with this. So you don't want to build the whole product yourself because you know that's not what you're doing. But the data that comes out, you want that for yourself so that you can own that data. You can build uh, analytics. You can action the data, et cetera. And I think if if you're moving to that mindset, then, of course, there's impact from, from sort of what's happening on privacy, but it's not that bad. I think what has mostly been impacted is what's like third-party cookies. So I, I, I the way I think about it is like you're on the high street. You go to a shop. You go and you look at a uh, pair of shoes. Great. You come back three days later to so the same shop and uh, the shopkeeper says, oh, here are the shoes you looked at the last time. I think that's great service. I like that. Now, another, another example. I go look at the shoes. I go to another shop. It's a completely different shop. And now they say, yeah, those shoes you looked at, they would go really well with a swimsuit or whatever. A spooky. Like that's that's what? creepy and you don't like that, right? Yeah. That, I think for me, that is the thing that is that is more or less, it's not gone away, but it's going away. And that's the thing that was freaking people out. It's not sort of the, I know, you know, how to put things up in my shop or I know how to talk to my customers if they're looking at, if they've been looking at this content, it's great that when you engage with them, you can talk about that content. Nobody minds that. I think what people mind is the other thing. Um, and that's the thing. When when people talk about sort of cookies dying, it's specifically like third-party cookies that are really dead now. And anybody who relied a lot on that, that's not good. No bueno. No. And I think it's fair. I mean, nobody yeah, liked it. It is fair. It is. Uh, it was fair. It's super creepy, right? To be, it feels like stalking, right? Or you go and all of a sudden on a poster, like in a mall, somebody is advertising 
for those shoes that you looked at. It's also weird. It's like, it's great that you sort of. It is. It is creepy. I think it's creepy on social that, you know, depending on where you are, um, all of a sudden people that have been around you in a, a certain place that you frequent all of a sudden come up, start coming up on your feeds. Yeah. You no, know, that's super creepy, <clears throat> right? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I think but anyway, the way that that's an aside. This is sort of <laughs> that's sort of a big tech question and how they treat data. And I think they just have where it, like for our companies, they have a data swamp. You build a beautiful sort of first party data, um, data model for them. Well, big tech, that's what they're doing as well, but they just have like, I don't know, a billion times more data, right? Yes. And then it gets creepy. Yes. <laughs> and then it gets creepy. <laughs> but dream data is helping people build their first party data. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Very much. That's awesome. Very, very much. Yeah. So Lars, tell me a little bit about you. Like you're a contrarian. You've had people that have fostered you <laughs> in that. Were you always that way when you were little? You know, growing yeah, up, do you <laughs> totally. I, I definitely see myself as a as a person that was always like that. Uh and I, I wouldn't say I've had, but I've oh, I've also had professional situations where uh maybe I've gone sort of too far and people have got upset with it. It's like if you sort of I, 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 you know, it's also maybe just a personal flaw, just also becoming a bit, I don't know how to what's the word, but like uh overconfident. And then hockey, um, like maybe, hockey in America. Yeah. And also just sticking, sticking to your sort of opinion for too long. And I think maybe I, I got a little bit better at accepting differences of opinion in, 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 in those conversations. So that helps a lot. But uh, when I was younger, that definitely could create problems. I think what, what I, what I'm doing now, I think at our company is trying to make sure that people who work here, can be contrarian and can sort of can they can be disruptors as well right i think contrarian people and rebels or whatever you want to call them if if you let them be rebels or let them sort of misbehave they can create magical things right for you and, uh, and so that yeah good for you hey. do you have any crazy <laughs> passions outside of dream data Crazy. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, my latest passion is so Copenhagen is a different kind of city from most American big cities. It's like a lot of families will stay sort of in the center of the city and then live in apartments. So we we live in an apartment. We have a communal yard, and we we have a, like a pizza oven, right? In the wood fired yard. pizza. Oven. Cool. Yes, a wood fired pizza oven, and that can create a lot of uh, sort of nerdy. Um, projects around like how to make the perfect dough how do you get it hot enough what to put on those pizzas etc so i think that's it, it maybe not a crazy passion but that's my my latest that's your latest uh, non non-work passion uh that can take up quite a bit of time wow how fun okay what's the craziest pizza you've ever come up with on that sense and not that i wouldn't say that they're great i think we're more about great ingredients um Okay, what's the best yeah. pizza? The yummiest pizza? Okay, but that's very boring. <laughs> okay, give me that's something so that's boring. not boring. The the boring answer to that is like a, a really really nice margarita pizza mm -hmm. is for me the best pizza. But yeah. that's of course super boring. So you you don't do like if you have a party or like people coming over for pizza, you're not gonna do like twenty margaritas because that's so. What do you do? Uh, but then like do you know in Julia? which is like um, some kind of, uh, yeah, it's pig plus chili, like a pasty kind of thing. Yeah. Very tasty. You put that on pizzas. You can also make like tomato sauce and, and turn it to pasta. It's very nice. Um, taking like sasicha, taking the, uh, the sort of crazy small meatballs, it's all right. that's also very nice for pizza. <laughs> Many things you can do. It sounds delicious. Jesus. You're, ma you're making me very Jesus. hungry. <laughs> Now, cheeses are good. Yeah, cheeses are great. Um, what's the best cheese to put on pizza, in your opinion? <laughs> I, I, again, it's like 
you have to put mozzarella there but like it, with the right things i goat cheese together with like potatoes uh like a white pizza with goat cheese super nice that yeah. sounds yummy you're making me hungry yes and one last <laughs> question about pizza do you like your pizzas well done like crispy well, and a little charred or do you like them yeah, yeah. a little softer uh so i think like on, on the surface like on the top side they have to be soft but they have to have this like speckles like leoparding it's called like so like little it's like dots of like not completely black and then underneath crispiness is nice right yes yeah. that's the perfect pizza <laughs> in my opinion okay yeah. awesome <laughs> we agree on that <laughs> we absolutely agree on that who doesn't love pizza yeah, no. It's universal. It's, um, it's the universal food, right? It's the yeah. dream food. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to go with dream there you pizza. Go. Okay, Have Lars. Dream how... data be dream pizza. What? Yeah, dream pizza. It's dream pizza. Dream data. Absolutely. Next project. <laughs> so, Lars, how do people get a hold of you? How do they get how do they find dream data? I think the best way is is LinkedIn. I think we are like we are as a company very active on LinkedIn. I'm on LinkedIn very active there. So connect with me on LinkedIn. Uh if you search for last chronicle or last dream data, you'll find me. Uh connect with me. I'm happy to connect with uh anybody listening um and engage there. I think that's a very good spot. Of course, we have a website, dreamdata.io, but it's more if you want to sort of acquaint yourself with what we do. But if you want to engage and talk just reach out to me or anybody else working here on LinkedIn. Um, that's a great way. Awesome. Well, I encourage our listeners to do that. Not only are you fun to talk to, you have a lot of good information. And I know certain companies are very interested in figuring out how to mine their data properly. Yeah. To make the dream. <laughs> make the dream. <laughs> Thank you, Lars. This has been awesome. Thanks. Uh, it's been great being on the show. Thanks. You bet. That's a wrap. That's a wrap. That's a wrap, everyone. If you learned something today or laughed, go tell someone about this podcast and tell people to go disrupt their markets with a tidbit from this show. Thanks for listening to Disruption Interruption, where we transform lives, change consumer behavior, alter economics, and never accept the status quo. Ciao for now. Because we live in a highly litigious society, with America being one of the top litigious countries in the world, here's our legal disclaimer. This information is not intended to be a substitute for professional public relations or legal advice. Do not disregard seeking professional legal, healthcare, or financial advice, or delay seeking professional PR or legal advice because of something you have heard here. Contact an attorney to obtain advice on any particular legal situation or problem. Use of this podcast or our website or any of its social media or email links do not create an agency-client relationship between Joto PR and the user.